Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Or we'll just say emotion versus reason. And the idea that she's, she's saying is this has been seen as female. This has been seen as male, um, traditionally, throughout, throughout history. Um, now, are, are there exceptions to this? Yeah, I can think of some really important exceptions going all the way back into Western, you know, early Western civilization. How many of you read the Odyssey at one time or another? Remember all those passages where Odysseus is crying? That really struck me. Because, I, I, you know, I grew up in a household where boys didn't cry and you were expected to be tough and all that. And here you have this guy who is one of the toughest warriors of ancient Greece. Um, not only one of the toughest, but one of the smartest. I mean, this guy could mow people down. And he's, you know, a king of his own little island. And he's in charge of all these men. And when his men die, he grieves them. He cries as he's rowing. As a matter of fact, it's not just him. The rest of his crew are all crying. They're all crying together. Um, you know, it's not the case that all men throughout history have... You know, never expressed emotions or anything like that. Um, but Held is on to something. She says, <clears throat> we're looking at moral theory. We're not just looking at literary stuff, but moral theory. What have been the main moral theories in the modern era? Um, well, the two biggest ones have been, on the one hand, sort of Kantian deontology, and on the other hand, something like utilitarianism. And it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, Bentham's utilitarianism. It could be what we call rational choice theory, which gets used in economics and in business, um, in some other contexts like that. And it doesn't always have to be Kant's deontology. It could be some other duty-based conception. Uh, but the idea is either you have duty and you recognize that duty, and it doesn't matter how you feel about it. What matters is you do the duty because it's your duty, and if you feel bad in doing it because it goes against your, your emotions or your desires, now you know you're really doing it, don't you? Now you can be sure that you're doing the right thing. Um, the other possibility is, well, your desires, your emotions, they count for something, but you have to you know, be rational about it. You have to calculate this. You have to take everybody's emotions and desires into consideration. And then you have to have this, you know, sort of grand calculus scheme and, and figure out which is going to benefit them the most. And in both cases, what ends up happening is either, um, so here's Kant, and then here's utilitarian. With Kant, you have reason, and then you have emotion or desire, and what do you want to do? Get rid of that and just focus on reason, right? Categorical imperative um, doesn't say anything about see how you feel about it, or how does this actually make you feel? It says, can you will that this be a universal law of nature? Can you conceive of this? And it doesn't say, would you like that? It says, can you will it? Can you rationally will it? So actually, you should put your emotions completely aside if you're a good conscience, in some respects. What about utilitarianism? Well, emotion or desire, uh, it's not you know, totally unacknowledged, but it gets taken into reason. And reason should dominate it. Reason should take it in and figure out how to reconcile all these things. Do we all you know, have the same feelings or emotions? Um, no, we tend to be kind of self-interested, don't we? 
And you're only going to get away from, you know, a self-interested perspective if you take a purely rational perspective, Bentham would say, or Mill would say. So um, in both of these cases, like she says, um, emotion gets, gets sort of pushed aside. And emotion does get identified with the, the female as opposed to the male, at least historically. So she says, uh, many feminist philosophers have questioned whether the reliance on abstract rules rather than the adoption of more context respectful approaches, and you know, what, what does that mean? That's a whole, that's kind of an abstract thing. The irony is she's, she's bashing abstract rules, then she gives you this very abstract sounding context respectful approaches. What, what do you think that would mean? Context respectful approaches. Well, it just means that it, it actually focuses on the actual case that you're in. So when you are in a real moral situation, and all of you have been in real situations, right, where you had to choose between one friend and another, or you know, decide whether to give the, the money back that you found, or you know, whether you should stay faithful to somebody or cheat on them when given the opportunity, all these sorts of, you know, protect the person who's being bullied or join in or walk away, all those sorts of cases, um, those are actual contexts, right? Do you have relationships with the people in those cases? Usually. Is most of your moral life concerned with absolute strangers who you've never met before? Some of it might be, right? You see somebody on the side of the road, they need some help, you don't know them, do you stop and help them? But what's most of your moral like, life like? Who are you engaged with? Who are you making decisions about? Think about your day-to-day -day life and the tough choices you make. Because each one of you makes some tough choices. Who is it? Who are you, who are you involved with? Parents, right? Parents are often a pain at your age. You have to figure out your, your, you guys are like renegotiating your entire relationship with them almost every time you go back, so at least some of you. You know, it's part of the, the process of becoming who, who you're on the, your way to being. Um, your friends. Do all your friends have exactly the same views? Are they all at the same moral caliber? Uh, do some of them try to get you to do things that you probably shouldn't do and others are like, ah, you've got to get away from that person? Uh, yeah, you, have, you are involved in, in context-specific things. Those of you who are planning on having kids later on, Kids are going to pose you with all sorts of moral problems that you have to solve. And oftentimes, it's not just because of your own kid's fault, it's because of their connection with these other kids, or their teacher, or you know what happened with the bus driver, or all these sorts of things. Those are all context-specific. So she's saying, rather than just relying on abstract rules, maybe we need some more context-respectful approaches. Um, and she says, um, women's experiences are particularly important when it comes to this. She says, women's experience of moral problems seems to lead us to be especially concerned with actual relationships between embodied persons and with what those relationships seem to require. Well, that's a good point. Again, that leads us to thinking about emotion. When you actually have a, a relationship with a person, and it's not just a purely business relationship, do you end up having some sort of emotional connection to them? Let's think about some of the types of relationships that, that you're in. I'm going to actually pick on the athletes here, because uh, I have so many of you. Um, do you form an emotional bond with your team, your teammates in any way? Or are they, you, you could take them or leave them, the hell with them. You don't really need them. What's your experience? Of course, you have a bond with your teammates. Yeah, you're going through a common experience together, right? And it's, it's, in a way, it's like going through boot camp, going through the practices you guys go through, or any of the, the other people that go through similar things. I mean, uh, anybody who does ballet, that's very grueling. That's very similar in many respects, very painful. Um, somebody's in your ballet class, and you go through it with them. You're, you should actually have some emotional connections for them. If you don't, there's something wrong. If you go through life and you don't have any feelings about the people who you work with, live with, um, 
engage in other activities with, that's, that's, you're missing out on something. You know, one of the best ways to start forming um, good connections with other people, that's why it's so, so particularly important to have this, this institution, eating together. When you sit down at a table with, with another person or people over and over again, and just, you know, just eat and, and share space and talk with them, you're not just being a body in the same place. There's an emotional connection that develops, isn't there? That's, that's one of the best ways, actually, to overcome prejudices, or at least to start on the, the path to that, to get people who don't, who don't want to eat together actually sitting and eating together, because inevitably they'll start finding out some, some things they have in common. Um, so, like she says, women are often inclined to attend to rather than dismiss the particularities of the context in which a moral problem arises. And, she says, we often pay attention, by, this, by the we, of course, she means women, we often pay attention to feelings of, particular feelings of empathy and caring. So there's a particular set of emotions that she thinks are much more relevant to moral life than, say, anger or sadness, or even necessarily joy. Empathy and caring. Um, now, it's a good question. Let's, let, let's go back to this again. What did Kant say about that sort of stuff? Did Kant think that you ought to feel empathy towards other people? Can you, can you require that of somebody as a moral duty? No. Even Ross said you, you, can't, you can't do that. You can, make, you can say that somebody has a duty to do something, but you can't say that they have a duty to feel a certain way about it. But isn't empathy or caring a feeling? So are you going to get empathy or caring just by coldly reasoning about things? How do, you, how do you get empathy? Or how do you end up sensing it within yourself? What, think, what goes on? I think some sort of emotion is, is involved in any sort of like, moral judgment that we make on this situation or something or someone. Yeah. Something like that. Like, I thought Kant's theory was stupid. I don't. I read your paper. Yeah. <laughs> but I can't understand how you can't have some sort of, you know, like... Yeah. I, I, and, and myself, I'm not a conscient. I, I'm, I'm much more sympathetic to this notion that we need some sort of emotional basis to, not just emotion, but some sort of emotional basis integrated with reason to make sense out of things. And, and Kant represents one particular way of looking at ethics that you, you know, find, you actually, and it's interesting, have an emotional reaction against it, don't you? Yeah. It's not just an intellectual reaction. You actually feel, this is wrong somehow. You feel a sense of what maybe repugnance would be the best way to describe it. Um, yeah, you know, what about utilitarianism? Utilitarianism says, well, you know, we take these sort of things into consideration. And didn't Bentham say, you know, we want people to have a, a motivation of benevolence? Um, so they take pleasure in other people's pleasure. Is that yet the same thing as empathy, though? What, what's empathy like for you guys? People have been empathetic towards you, I think, and you've been empathetic towards others. What does that mean? Let's take a sort of a, a typical kind of situation. You come to me in my office hours, and um, well, we'll use we'll use just the, the example of the hurricane, right? Um, plenty of you have have relatives who um, were much more in the path of the hurricane than than we were here in the Hudson Valley, and so some of you have you know a family who maybe the houses are damaged or they got injured or something like that. Uh, could that distract you from the work that you're supposed to do as a student? Do students fall behind sometimes in cases like that? Yeah, uh, you guys are far enough along, you've seen that sort of thing happen. So you come to me and you say, Dr. Sadler, um, and, I, and I know that you're a good student because you've been like keeping on track with the things and you've been, you know, following along in, in class and all that. You say, I, I'm just, you know, I'm not, I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, and I start talking with you and it turns out, you know, your, your dad got hurt in the storm, and you're really concerned about him. And um, 
let's say you have a couple of younger brothers or sisters too, and you're the oldest, right? So you're expected to be like the strong one. Um, but you're doing that from a, a distance. And you're Skyping in and doing things like that now that the internet has been restored. Um, but you, you know, you're really, it's bothering you. It's, it's affecting not just this class, but your other classes. And it's keeping you from being able to buckle down and get, get on with the work that you need to do. Now, um, I could just, you know, be like a robot and say, okay, you've given me the data, now I process it, okay, you get a pass, blah, 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 right? But th that's not what you want, is it? I mean, if you actually come to my office hours to explain your condition to me, you're looking for something more than that, aren't you? If I were just to have that sort of response, like, okay, here's a checklist, I'm going to rationally process this, uh, you qualify for an extension for this, how would you feel? Would you like that? That'd be a weird thing to do, wouldn't it? There may be a few professors who would act like that, that I could think of, uh, including some that I had. Um, what would it be like for me to be empathetic? Would it mean just to say, oh, oh it's so, so bad for you, Oh, oh, can I can I um, get you a blanket, you know, or something like that? Have some cookies. I want you to feel better. Is that is that empathy? No, that that's that's kind of weird, sickly kind of uh, I don't know what what to call it. Well, what's empathy? What's the thing in the middle like emotionally? You've had professors who have cared about you, right? Well, how how can you tell? What is it like for you when they do? What have your experiences been like? Yeah. Like they try to work with you and like help you through in like a reasonable way. Yeah, and now notice it, it's not just you know all mushy gushy, warm and fuzzy stuff. You use, they, they try to work with you, like you said, in a reasonable way. It doesn't mean that it becomes all pure, detached, abstract reason. And they do. It doesn't just have to do with feeling. It has to do with action too. They try to work with you. How can you tell they're trying to work with you? What does that feel like? What does that look like? Think about cases where you guys needed a professor to work with you like that. What was it like? I'm willing to bet every one of you has had some case like that come up at one time or another. Maybe not here, but maybe in high school or middle school. What was it like for you? Yeah. It was more comfortable and I work with you at your pace. Ah, that's an important thing. You're, you're treated as, not just as a case, but as a person. So you, they work with you, like you said, at your pace. Why? Well, because, you know, it's your pace. It's not going to do any good to say, well, you ought to be over here. I'm so ashamed that you're not over here. That'd be an emotion, but not a good one, right? That's not being empathetic. Being empathetic means sort of understanding the other person. It's part of what we call emotional intelligence. Um, emotional intelligence is not just about managing your own emotions. And it's not just about realizing what other people are feeling. It's about being able to sort of take in what they're feeling and make sense of it as something that matters to you. So if I'm empathetic towards your plight, that means that in some respect I care about, even though you're, you know, you're, you're a student, and I you know, may not have any connection with you after the class is over, I have some feeling for you as a person, uh, and your plight matters to me. And the way that you feel about it matters to me. And the way that you're able to perform or not perform matters to me. Your, your structure of motivation, you might say, is something that enters into my emotional life. Not dominating it. Um, that, would, that would be that mushy-gushy stuff over here but allowing me to do the kinds of actions that allow display of care, that give you what it is that you need in order to, to do better, to feel better, to flourish, ultimately. Um, how many of you have had, uh, like, you've been in the ER, or had an operation, or something like, like that? I know I've been in the ER many times for dumb stuff. Um, what is it like for, for a doctor to be empathetic? or a nurse to be empathetic. What does that feel like to you, as opposed to somebody who's just doing triage and getting you through there as quickly as possible? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm coming from the field that I work in, coming in from social work. Social yeah. work. You know, there's a whole sort of 
deal with trying to be empathetic as part of the, the core of social work. That's a tough one too, because yeah. you, you have to. What's the main risk? Well, the thing is about you know the thing is that in terms of trying to be empathetic, you, it's about being able to meet the person where they're at. Yeah, it's meeting. It's not bringing them to you, but to go to them and say, okay, where can I help you? And then allowing people to make one of our core ethics is self-determination. To yeah. make decisions for themselves and to support those decisions and to help guide those decisions in a way that's going to be beneficial to them. Uh, to see things from a point of view, from their point of view, and to try to understand their experience so mm -hmm. that you can address their experience in a way that's going to be beneficial. Yeah. It's about asking, you know, four questions in particular. You know, how am I feeling? How can I, you know, how, how is this person feeling? What do yeah. they need, feel, or want? What is the atmosphere? How do I best respond to that? You know, when, all of those things come play come into play when you're trying to, to work with clients. Yeah. And it's a perspective that, along with the feminist perspective, that, that a social worker is used to, to be empathetic. Yeah, and, and it takes it takes it takes work too. It doesn't takes it? practice. Yes. Yeah, that's. Is it good for somebody in social work to be like empathetic with somebody though? Like, well, ask somebody who's in it. Well, yeah. Well, you know, just because like, I feel like you may not always, you know, like being able, to, you know, like just being empathetic with somebody. Like, I feel like you may make the wrong decision for that person because you're being empathetic, but not not doing what's actually right for the child or the person. And that's what I was asking about with the risk. What's okay. the risk? Of and, and, but that's just it, that as in social work, my job is not to make decisions for you. My job is to help you make decisions for you that are going to benefit you. So I'm not saying to a... And, and also, there's, there's a lot of black and white, but there's also a lot of gray. Like a, a woman or a mother who's had their children taken away because of educational neglect. You know, so, okay, well, she's a bad mom because she's not sending her kids to school. Well, why isn't she sending her kids to school? Is it because she doesn't have a car? Is it because she doesn't have a job? Is it because she's working till 3 in the morning and they can't get up in the morning to take her kids to school? What are the reasons for that? You know, so a lot of times when we look at social work and we look at people, people make a judgment and say, oh, this is what it is, and that's why. Yeah. As a social worker, I have to be empathetic and say, okay, what are the reasons that this person is not getting their kids to school. Is and it because you know, they're a lot bad of that, mom? Yeah, a lot of that looks to be le less a matter of emotion, more a matter of like um, processes of inquiry. Right. You know, figuring out um, why why are things the case. Now, maybe emotion drives it uh, to a certain extent. You say this person actually matters, so I'm going to care enough to find out the reasons why. But this is this is a, a, a real tension. Um, Let's go on with this, though. There's a few other things I want, to, I want to point out. This is a good discussion. She brings up this idea of an ethics of care, and she says um, that an ethics of care needs to be developed. Some think it should supersede what she's going to call an ethic of justice, and we're going to look at that a little bit more later. Um, and what would that look like? She says um, it reevaluates the place of emotion and morality in two different ways. Some think that morality requires the development of moral emotions. And, and so this is a good thing to consider. What are moral emotions? Are there certain emotions that matter more for moral life than others? We've already talked about care and we've talked about empathy. Um, she's not going to talk about anger. Anger by itself, though, we've, we've discussed this quite a bit. Why do people get angry? They feel that some moral wrong has been committed either against themselves or against somebody else. Um, there could be other moral emotions that are important too, like indignation, or like or that sense of repugnance that you felt, you know, when thinking about Kant and his dismissal of the emotions, right? Maybe that that sense of repugnance is a moral emotion, something that should guide us. Um, the second thing is, if in an ethics of care, emotion is going to be respected rather than dismissed, um, in the process of gaining moral understanding. So, what this means is not just that, well, we've got emotions or something like that, but that emotions would be actually used as a guide for moral decision-making, which is pretty big. That's definitely going against what Kant is saying, and that would even go against what Bentham is saying. 
Um, and you know, think about other people we've discussed, Plato, that would go against what Plato is saying. I leave it up to you as we go through it whether that would be against what Aristotle is saying. Maybe not. But that we'll have to explore a little bit a little bit later.